Hi everybody, it's Mrs. Wallace. I hope this video finds you well. I hope that your family's doing well. Um, happy Friday. Uh, just, you know, I think it's most important that everybody stays safe and sound, so we'll do the best we can uh, with the situation at hand and um, just ask questions. If you feel like you have any, there'll be a spot uh, for every single day that we have class where you can just note a question. Um, if there's something that wasn't clear, you know, you're welcome to always send me an email um, and we'll kind of do the best we can to use, you know, just kind of writing back and forth, um, audio back and forth, you know, as a way to uh, describe things. So um, we were talking about the Renaissance and the Renaissance art um, in particular. And some of the reasons why we were talking about the Renaissance is just to kind of showcase the flip between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And keep in mind this um, shift is a little bit of, you know, debatable. How much the late Middle Ages is really different than the Renaissance, when this actually starts, you know, is kind of the topic of a great deal of debate. But um, at least we can uh, suggest that maybe there are a few key key characteristics that we see differently in art in the Renaissance, especially the high Renaissance, uh, than we see in the Middle Ages. So um, the sheet that you have, that's a handout, um, and some of you might have seen this in class the other day if you had finished your um, your benchmark, you might have moved on to this other assignment. If this is like a new sheet that you're looking at, kind of just go with the flow. There's four uh, questions on the handout. You can pull it up right um, from Schoology. It's called uh, the Renaissance Art Question Sheet. And, you know, just take some bulleted uh, notes. And I'm just going to review some of the uh, works of art. And uh, we'll have a discussion that is um, using some of these works of art. So I'm not collecting your notes. The notes are for you. Um, just kind of enjoy looking at some of the pieces of art and consider, you know, how one work of art might be different than the next than the next because they're kind of laid out chronologically. So with these four different examples, you know, similar to what we did in class, this is kind of an opportunity for you to research. And um, you're certainly welcome to uh, continue to work on the sheet, add details and information, and pull up uh, you know, kind of stronger Google images of these works of art. And you can also do some additional um, background. I'm going to give you kind of the key things to look for in each of these works of art. You could certainly go back and add details uh, to your notes, okay? Um, what we're looking at uh, initially is um, a work of art that is called The Last Judgment. And it's a tympanum, so it's actually like above a door in a church. So this is a painting with some religious content. It's kind of a Christian content, um, but it would be kind of as people are moving into a church building, they would be presented with this. And remember, lots of people in the Middle Ages, this is um, done somewhere around the early 1100s. So it's even earlier than the first Middle Ages painting that we looked at from Berlingiero in class. Um, this is a partial sculpture, right? It's not complete. It's not in the round. You can't walk around it. But we do see in the late Middle Ages some interest in kind of what, um, you know, is a little bit three-dimensional, this idea of kind of a three-dimensional uh, sculpture. Um, and uh, the content of this is very, very, you know, Middle Ages. It really connects a lot with that great chain of being. And um, even though we don't know who the specific um, sculptor is, um, often this Last Judgment tympanum it, which is in France. It's in a um, the Autun Chapel in France, which if you Google um, is massive. It's a huge, huge, huge uh, chapel. And so this work of art is actually quite large. Um, Gisel Burtis is often um, kind of targeted as the artist or the sculptor, um, we're not really sure. It's not really clear. Um, but the key thing about this particular work of art, and I'm just going to zoom into it a, a little bit here, you can see um, that there are levels to it, right? So kind of like the great chain of being. Um, what we're uh, seeing here is kind of a um, omnipotent uh, divine figure, you know, God, or perhaps in the Christian tradition, maybe uh, Jesus Christ. Um, but there is um, a stance in a sense that this is almost um, in kind of a um, 
uh, heavenly or otherworldly place, okay? This is not an earthly scene. This is happening um, after people die. So the scene is kind of um, taking place where there's um, judgment. And we're told this is judgment day. This is the last judgment. On um, the left side, we may, might see some representations of angels. There are particularly up here kind of, you know, you know uh, figures with wings. Um, and so there are people who are being... Um, kind of uh, pulled into heaven after Judgment Day. Um, some of the folks that are down here are waiting to be plucked to decide whether or not they're going to heaven, which is kind of on the left-hand side here, or if they're going to be going to hell. And if you're able to see, you know, kind of close in here, it's a little bit hard to see, but on the side that's really representative of hell, there's like these demon figures. There's a snake at the bottom. There's kind of, um, the demon figures have big jaws and they're holding um, individuals that are being plucked up. Here there's one, you know, person that's being plucked up out of his sarcophagus, right, out of his tomb after death uh, by these hands, which are going to be plucking him right up, and then he's going to be in this uh, scene where he's going to be put on a scale, and the mass that he is, you know, weighing is going to dictate whether or not he's going to, you know, heaven or hell. So it's like sin, in a sense, or bad deeds, you know, has a uh, weight. And if you've ever heard the phrase, you know, to hell in a handbasket, you know, this is like a literal thing. These monsters are actually carrying hand baskets and they're delivering people to hell. And the monsters, even though their faces look like atrocious, there's also um, this sense that the uh, individuals also are fearful, right? So this Middle Ages kind of worldview is very focused on um, like life, you know, after death. And there's also a sense of like this Middle Ages worldview kind of depicting, you know, you better get it together, you know, on earth because you're uh, situation is going to be, you know, kind of uh, coming to a determination about, you know, what kind of person you are on earth and everything that uh, matters is this particular day, you know, the last judgment. So it relates a lot to that great chain of being and kind of, you know, frames in a sense for us some of what the Middle Ages worldview um, may have been like, okay, and kind of the role of the church perhaps in that. Um, a lot of the individuals who are visiting churches to put their hands on, you know, sacred relics like like a saint's bones or something like that. Some of those um, efforts to try to reduce one's sins are to put people on the left-hand side of this rather than um, on the other side. This next work I'm not going to go into a lot, um, but uh, the artist is actually really significant. So this is called Presentation at the Temple. Uh, this is Giotto, who is often, um, you know, kind of described as an artist who's significant because he is, um, you know, moving in the late Middle Ages toward uh, the Renaissance and uh, place him kind of in the late uh, 1200s. And this is a presentation of uh, kind of the, the in, this is in the um, uh, Jewish custom and Jesus Christ who is this divine figure in the tr Christian tradition um, who is not necessarily looked at as a messiah in the Jewish faith um, but is born as a Jew and kind of goes through a variety of different Jewish customs and that's what Giotto is displaying here um, is like a presentation of the baby you know to a rabbi and the rabbi is kind of giving the baby back to Mary who is Jesus's mother and why Giotto gets um, kind of a lot of attention for humanism in this particular work of art. Um, a lot of it has to do with the look on the baby's face. You know, and it's hard to kind of see, but if you can Google the image and see it a little bit uh, cleaner, um, the baby kind of gives the rabbi this look like, you know, I don't think so. Um, I can't wait to go back to my mother. You know, he gives the rabbi this look like, you know, who are you? And it's such a typical kind of kid face that um, it smacks of like a humanist uh, approach to the way in which the content of the, the painting is. And if you also look at the background, there's this significant effort to kind of use um, shading, lighting, uh, color in the background to kind of have the um, sky uh, demonstrate some atmospheric perspective. So this idea of what's behind and what's front, it's not like it's a completely three-dimensional scene, but there's a great deal of techniques that give the illusion of space. Everything from, you know, this uh, maybe, um, you know, 
know, the pillars that are in the middle to the sky in the background. There's a great deal of effort to give us a sense of uh, three-dimensional space, but we still have a Middle Ages uh, painting, largely, you know, with the halos and whatnot, okay? Um, this particular uh, work of art is called um, Tribute Money, and it's by Masaccio, who I can't really take it too much, uh, you know, in inward, right? Um, but Masaccio, who is really early Renaissance, okay? And I would attach Masaccio kind of to this late 1300s, early 1400s. This painting um, is known for being really significant because of the way there is a much cleaner mathematical approach to perspective. So something that Masaccio is doing is practicing a linear perspective. He's establishing a vanishing point, and then there would be orthogonal lines that are kind of ma mathematically to scale that are enabling um, the way in which objects that are closer to the vanishing point might be smaller so that they're further away. Objects that are um, kind of, you know, the, the, the entire spacing and sizing um, is really, really uh, important in the way in which uh, Masaccio is designing um, what's behind in the mountains, um, who's in front, and whatnot. So there's a great deal of perspective in this. Um, we see much more three-dimensional attempts. You have layers in a sense, right? You have the figures in the front, you have the trees, right? You have the mountains, and you have the sky, and the building that's here, okay? There's also and some additional attempts at perspective. There is this atmospheric uh, perspective in the background, a great deal of naturalism also, so we have this kind of scene placed in a very human environment. It's still a divine scene, and we know that because of the halos, um, and we also can look at the clothing, right? Um, this uh, figure here is meant to be Jesus Christ, who as now um, a grown um, man is being approached by a tax collector. Um, Masaccio has given us, you know, kind of a clothing difference for this figure, who's a Roman tax collector, and he's come basically to collect the tax. He wants to know, you know, from Jesus and some of his followers, his disciples, you know, could I have the tax? And um, the followers are kind of outraged. They're talking amongst each other, like, how could this actually be? You know, we have, you know, this divine figure here. Um, we can't expect him to pay a tax. And um, Jesus, and this is a kind of based on a biblical story, you know, kind of says, you know, give unto Caesar what is Caesar and give unto God what is God's. And ultimately, um, we will pay the Attack. So it kind of sets up, you know, the role for the church, and yet the role for the political system is to kind of do its job, and we all can be a part of that on earth. So there's some content in here that's significant as well, but the um, thing that Masaccio does is kind of give us a little bit of a timeline in this. Um, what he does is he kind of has the main figure of Jesus in the center, so it's kind of where our eyes go. We've got some contrasting colors, so our eyes are kind of paying attention to this, and then if we follow the hand and the scene, um, we are kind of can see that um, maybe Peter is directed to go to the water, and it's from a fish's mouth where um, the biblical story suggests that there's actually a coin that then gets paid to the tax collector. So it's like scene one is being asked for, you know, the tax. Scene two is Peter getting the coin. And then scene three is um, Peter, right, same character here and here, who's actually paying the tax. So we have um, kind of this temporal perspective thing going on as well. There's multiple um, time periods, you know, that are also addressed in this. So by the Renaissance, we have this like kind of almost um, expanded view of the way in which storytelling and reading a painting is going to happen. It's almost like as if you're reading a book, you're kind of reading the painting in a story fashion, and it tells you something. And there's a great deal of kind of, you know, humanism and naturalism in this, in the way that the figures are displayed, um, kind of as human uh, characters in a human space. Um, we also have kind of this idea of math mathematical perspective, um, which is something perhaps arguably unique uh, to the Renaissance, but is tying in with some classical ideas, okay? The very, very last, um, you know, kind of a work of art is a sculpture that Michelangelo is responsible for, one of the few. If you look on the left, right, you get um, a sense of Michelangelo's David. It is hard to miss. Um, this is a large statue that is in Florence. There's actually a couple of copies of them, so now the uh, statue is inside. At one point in time, it was 
was outside, so it becomes very representative. This is something that the city of Florence was a patron of. They wanted this particular statue, and Michelangelo took a very difficult um, block of marble that other artists were having a really hard time with and trying to do it. And, you know, Michelangelo's David tells the story of another biblical story where this underdog David is trying to kill this giant Goliath. And the way in which he does it is with a slingshot. In the biblical story, David is a kid, right? He's a young, young boy. Um, in uh, Michelangelo's version, you know, this is no longer a kid. This is a young man who is ready to um, take this slingshot, which he's got here, and he's just about to snap it back. And the eyes, which are a little bit hard to see in this, but if you can get a good version, are um, powerful. It's giving us a sense of the slingshot.